But today we have a wonderful guest to talk about the free speech crisis on campus. And so I guess we'll, we'll create an intellectual space for just a little bit, and then we'll go back to just babbling and incoherence. Uh, here to join us to tell us what to do about this crisis is North Carolina Lieutenant Governor Dan Forrest, who is the driving force behind the Restore Campus Free Speech Act. Your Honor, thank you for being here. I'm not a judge, Michael, but uh, thank you very much. Uh, it's, uh, it's great to be with you. Thanks for having me on. I, I certainly uh, enjoyed uh, the lead in to this. I think it was pretty apropos and we don't always have the time to set these things up like you just did. So we can uh, jump right in. Well, thank you very much. And I must tell you, I'll apologize for the, uh, the greeting. It's, it's very difficult to figure out the title for Lieutenant Governor. I obviously would prefer to call you <laughs> Governor already. Uh, I'd even be happy to call you President because of all of your uh, excellent leadership on this issue. Uh, just quickly, you know, I think we can, we've knocked down all of this ridiculous argument that there isn't a crisis. You have been a, a leader on this issue. What does this bill do? What does this law do, rather? Well, I mean, you know, let's take let's take a step back, right? I mean, I think what we have to do is a lot of times is get to the heart of these matters. I think you set it up appropriately. Uh, the professor in that uh, last clip you were playing there set it up appropriately too. You know, the real question is who gets to decide these things. That's what needs to be emblazoned in the minds of these uh, students who are saying, let's control all this speech, let's create all these safe spaces against uh, us haters and and uh, bigots and and phobes of all different kinds. Who gets to decide? Uh, what is uh, appropriate speech and what is not. Well, to the left, it's the left that gets to decide what is appropriate speech. And so we've seen all over the country, as you mentioned earlier, the heckler's veto. It has become the new way to tell people what they can and can't say on college campuses. So we've had students all over the country and faculty members and so forth, the faculty or the administration themselves, that invite speakers to come to a campus and speak uh, about whatever the topic may be. And then you have the heckler's veto shut them down. And you and I would both agree that um, the shutting down of free speech does not equal free speech. And that's what we've really seen all over the country is these people think they're operating under their First Amendment rights when they do this. But this is really not what the First Amendment was created to do. So we want to protect the First Amendment. We want to protect free speech. And I'm not a big fan of just creating policy for the sake of creating policy. But what we've seen is that our colleges and universities across the country, and even here in North Carolina, had run amok on this. And I personally believe that we don't need safe spaces on college campuses. I believe America is a free speech zone. It's a, it should be a safe space. And uh, we need to make sure that all of our campuses abide by the same kind of laws that we do, uh, you know, uh, everywhere else in America. So uh, we saw this happening. We said we need to nip this in the bud in North Carolina. We need to make sure that what happened at Berkeley and other places doesn't happen here. So we started to craft policy along with Stanley Kurtz, Goldwater Institute, and others that did just that. And uh, the way that we went about that was just trying to be very reasonable and, and really try to um, assign this policy <clears throat> to protect the First Amendment for all students on the campus. And so we put together what we believe is a kind of a uniform standard policy that we would like to see rolled out across the country. But you mentioned FIRE earlier as well, and I'll, I'll hit on them. FIRE is this nonpartisan foundation that ranks universities and colleges across the country on uh, their access to free speech. So, so they have, as you know, a green light, yellow light, red light rating system. And if you're green, you're good for free speech. And if you're yellow, you're not as good. And if you're red, that's just bad. Well, when we started this process, we had of our 17 ins public institutions, higher, um, higher education institutions, we had one green light university in North Carolina. Wow. That was the University of Chapel Hill. We started talking about that, just talking about this. The policy had not been enacted yet. Prior to the policy being enacted, just because we were bringing it to people's attention and letting them know we were paying attention, we moved from one to six institutions pretty much overnight. And I'll give the, the campuses credit for this as they stepped up and said, we want to be a green light institution. So we saw just the fact that um, the political environment was paying attention, we saw the universities pay attention as well. 
So I'll just hit the highlights and you can ask questions, but the highlights of, of the policy are real simple. It just said you can't shut down somebody's free speech. If they're invited to the campus, there has to be a time, place, and manner for them to be able to speak freely without the heckler's veto. There still has to be a time, place, and manner for demonstrations to take place, or even spontaneous demonstrations, but you can't shut down somebody else's free speech and call it free speech. And if you do that again and again and again, then there are repercussions for doing that. With due process, due process should always uh, take place, but we put our board of governors who oversees our university system in charge of this, and we said, you know what, we're not gonna shut down professors' free speech, we're not gonna tell them what to say, we're not going to control the environment on the university in any way other than to say, the university campus is a free speech zone. And so we really opened up our universities to make sure we protected our students, make sure that our university system and the individual campuses didn't get involved, didn't involve their students in um, the process of policy uh, at the uh, General Assembly, telling them, requiring them of how they needed to act in regard to the, those kind of policies being created. And that the point of that heckler's veto, that's such an important point to drive home, that there are repercussions for this, that it is not free speech. Chesterton wrote in Orthodoxy, he said, there's a thought that stops thought, and that's the only thought that ought to be stopped. There, there is speech that stops speech, and you can't, you can't have that. Those aren't, there's no moral equivalence there. It's, it's wonderful to hear that the campuses actually stepped up or at least a lot of the campuses did and said no we want to protect free speech we didn't realize we weren't doing this and we want to do it now and yet when, when this passed the legislature in north carolina you got ten yes votes from democrats the senate however uh, passed it along strict party lines and your governor democrat roy cooper allowed it to pass into law without vetoing it that's very good but also without signing it what does that say about the momentum for these kind of laws, about the appetite? Why are Democrats still keeping this at arm's length when even many colleges want to embrace it and want to live up to the highest ideals of the university? Well, I think because the uh, left has co-opted the Democrat Party, there's just, you know, that's just the way it is, and they have to appease their base. And so the reason the Senate uh, voted for it unanimously in North Carolina is because all the Democrats walked out of the room. So it was just Republicans actually voting on it. The Democrats decided to get up and leave. Uh, they didn't do that in the House. So they played, uh, they played political football with this one. And the governor, again, just kind of ignored it and said, oh, well, I want to play it both ways. I'm not going to sign it. Uh, and, you know, they all just kind of pander and say there's a lot of things we don't like about it, but there's some things we do like about it. Listen, we worked very closely with the university system. We wanted the universities, universities and the chancellors to be partners in this. We believe it protects the chancellors. We believe it protects the universities. Why would you pick a side and, and run headlong with a certain side that could get you in trouble as a university by going out against the, the First Amendment? Uh, so we, we think that protects chancellors. It, it keeps chancellors from having to stand up in front of their mob on the university and say, we're picking a side on this because you mob want us to pick a side. The chancellors can say, we don't get engaged in these things. We don't get engaged in this. Our, our campus is a free speech zone and we're going to protect free speech. And we're not going to you know, spend a whole lot of time worrying about safe spaces and trigger warnings and all these kind of things that we're seeing pop up all over, all over America. You know, you and I get offended every single day. We don't right. crawl into our hole and start crying about our offense, right? We want to go do something about it. If we're offended, we want to teach people. We want to, we want to educate people. The reason students act this way about the First Amendment is because we allowed a whole group of students to pass through 13 grades of school to go on to college without ever learning a single thing about our Constitution, why our Constitution exists, why the principles of that Constitution were founded upon our Declaration of Independence, why did that matter, what were the grievances that our founding fathers had against the king that all came from the foundation of Western civilization and a great history that came before that. We don't teach these things anymore, and so we, because we don't teach these foundations, uh, we have a whole generation of people now that have no basis for the understanding of uh, these things that they're out espousing and protesting against and anything else. They are the most highly credentialed and least educated generation one could imagine. And you make the excellent yeah. point on the chancellors and on the university presidents, which is that the universities that have caved or been unclear about how they're going to deal with free speech issues, they have totally imploded. 
Uh, I, I remember when Yale was sort of ground zero for this, I wrote a letter to the president of Yale and I said, you think that you're protecting yourself by playing nicely with these kids and trying to accommodate them. This will not work out for you. They will not rest here. Their, their goal is not to preserve the ideals of the university. It's to hollow out the university. Whereas uh, places like Purdue University, where former Indiana Governor Mitch Daniels is president, he made it very clear. He said, we support free speech. This is not a negotiation. I'm just telling you how it is. Everything calmed down. The University of Chicago, same thing. Other states now are following your lead. What do you think the future is for this type of laws uh, around the country? Are, are the, is this going to be a movement across the country, or is there a limit to, to uh, how far these will reach? Well, well, we'll have to wait and see. I think in North Carolina right now, I may be corrected, but I think we have 10 of our universities out of our 16 uh, large public universities uh, that are green lights now. There were only 32 of them in the country, so we had a third of them right here in North Carolina. So far it's working here, and we haven't had any big incidences yet. But when that incidence happens, the response of the university is going to be really important. The response of our Board of Governors is going to be really important. The response of the General Assembly is going to be really important. And that's what's really going to be the proof in the pudding of this. Not that you create a policy, right? You can set the speed limit, but if everybody disobeys the speed limit, right. it doesn't matter if you have signs all over the interstate. So right now we place the signs up. You know, if we place the guardrails out there, we'll see how everybody stays between the lines when push comes to shove. But I think it's good model legislation for the whole country. I think we've proved that at least the universities, uh, we have, again, 10 of them working towards 16, but we have 10 of them that want to uh, play this game the right way, just like Mitch Daniels does at Purdue. And so um, I think if, if we can keep moving along those tracks, we're going to start to educate the students as well. One of the provisions in this bill was to uh, have freshman orientation classes on free speech, to be able to actually tell these students what free speech means and what the campus free speech policy is. That's a really good first step, and we'll see how it plays out over time. It's so important because someone asked me a question at a talk. They said, how should we treat the left? How should we interact with them when they don't know so much about our civic history and our constitution and our founding documents. I say, you know, in some ways you should treat them like children. And I don't, you don't want to smack a child around. That's no good. You know, no good parent does that. You, uh, you just want to put information out there and hopefully instruct somebody. And now where there are so many mandatory trainings and classes and this and that, the idea that perhaps you should learn a thing or two about free speech and free expression as an American ideal is just a wonderful way to, to get in there and lay, lay the foundation for hopefully a generation that can be both educated and credentialed and preserve American liberty, which is only one generation away from extinction at any given time. Uh, Lieutenant Governor Dan Forrest, I've taken up a lot of your time, and you have to go get back to work because you were doing excellent work on this issue and others. So thank you so much for being here. Thank you, Michael. I enjoyed it. We'll look forward to the next time.